All right, let's go ahead and get started. First, I'd like to thank everyone who's joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Using Cloud Native Technologies to Solve Complex Application Security Challenges in Kubernetes Deployments. I'm Sheila Savy, CNCF Ambassador and Open Source Program Manager at Comcast, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We'd like to welcome our presenters today, Shreyans Mehta, the co-founder and CTO of Sequence Security. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to talk as an attendee. We do have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in there and we'll get to as many as, as we can at the end of the uh, webinar. With that, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Shreyans to kick off today's presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, hi again, uh, my name is Shreyans Mehta and uh, uh, like, like I was introduced, I'm co-founder and CTO at Sequence Security. Today in the webinar, I'm going to talk about uh, mostly introducing a new way to do application security, especially focusing on the runtime application security aspects where we have more and more APIs, more applications that are being exposed uh, through containers uh, in like Kubernetes and microservices environments. Uh, so before I kick it off, uh, I just want to briefly talk about uh, our company, uh, Sequence Security. Um, we are a venture-backed uh, startup uh, focusing primarily on application security space. Um, we build uh, an AI-powered security platform, which is actually delivered as containers uh, to protect the web, mobile, and API-based applications uh, from bot or sometimes called as business logic attacks, as well as vulnerability exploits. Uh, we are completely built on top of cloud na native components like Kubernetes, Envoy, Prometheus, and the likes. And we play well with the uh, existing ingress controllers like sidecars, like uh, Envoy and Nginx. So you don't necessarily need to replace them to uh, use technologies like ours. And for more information about us, you can obviously visit our site, uh, sequence.ai. So kicking it off, uh, so uh, the world as we see it, uh, there, uh, there are a lot of public, publicly facing applications and uh, you need to expose them publicly for a number of reasons, uh, primarily for your customer interactions. Sometimes you might have mobile applications uh, that need to uh, talk to, uh, to the actual apps on the back end using mobile APIs. You might have supplier APIs, you might have partner APIs. And the moment you expose them, um, you are exposed to uh, the bad or malicious actors as well. Um, and these kinds of exposures can, uh, uh, can lead to attacks like what we call as the business logic abuse attacks. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit more in detail uh, around the attacks themselves. Uh, but they are very aut uh, highly automated uh, in nature. Um, these kinds of attacks uh, going are really go after the business logic or the applications themselves. Uh, typically, more about the contract uh, of uh, of communication rather than the the syntax of the communication. Uh, so the content really appears to be legitimate, but we are uh, they are actually very difficult to detect and block using traditional um, signature-based technologies. And then there, there are these traditional attacks, uh, what uh, we call as attacks uh, on vulnerabilities. Uh, they are highly targeted. Uh, they uh, can be both uh, known attacks or zero-day exploits, depending on uh, uh, how they are, they are being executed. So that's sort of the high level view of the uh, application attack landscape, uh, primarily at the, at the runtime. So uh, let's talk a little bit about how they, these kinds of attacks are being um, uh, sort of protected against, uh, at least so far. And, uh, and, and the traditional world is all about monolithic applications. Um, and Think uh, for our discussion, uh, think of a retail application that has uh, 
let's say user management uh, on its side it has a shopping cart it has um, a, a place for reviews uh, ratings of, of the products that you're selling and all of that is packaged in as a single monolithic application um, and 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 you need to protect that right uh, and this is the traditional way and the traditional way is to protect that using what is uh, called as a perimeter defense, where you, uh, you have this application that is scaling up, up and down using a load balancer, and then you have sort of a layers of defenses put in front of it before uh, this application is hit uh, by, by the uh, end user. So the first um, kind of defense uh, is, is uh, the defense against uh, vulnerability exploits. Um, and you can think of it as, uh, as a couple of examples. The first uh, thing that you put in place is the web application firewall. And this web application firewall has, uh, is doing a couple of things. Uh, it is trying to protect the application from um, more like OWASP type of attacks. Uh, it is also needed for compliance in, in, in a lot of cases. Um, it is uh, it is it is helping you uh, prevent against um, uh, vulnerability scans. Think Metasploit, uh, think OpenVAS, which is trying to expose any vulnerable applications that you might be running. So you might be running uh, something like a, a vulnerable PHP application or a Node.js application. So it's it's trying to uncover that, uh, and that becomes sort of the first phase of the attack. The second phase of, uh, is really uh, oh, that your WAF is also protecting against is the actual breaches themselves. Uh, you're running your entire user uh, database uh, on the back end, and somebody could actually exfiltrate the entire uh, user database, uh, PII information, transactions, all of that through through attacks like SQL injection, or you might have uh, something like uh, Elasticsearch search server that is exposed. So the job of a web application firewall is to protect uh, against these kinds of attacks that uh, lead to exfiltration or the actual exploit themselves. So uh, you need that. The second part uh, that we spoke about earlier um, is also about the highly automated uh, attacks uh, that are also called uh, bot attacks. So think of a case, uh, now in this case, this is uh, uh, a retail site that we are talking about. So bad actors, especially competitors, uh, can come in and scrape the entire uh, database of inventory that you might have. They might use that against you in terms of the pricing information that you have, uh, and then competitively put uh, prices on their own site. Sometimes uh, we also see uh, competitors scraping content, which is uh, really your IP, uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than using it maliciously. They are they they might uh, even use that to develop their own uh, own content around it, based on what you have uh, posted on your site. Uh, we also see in the retail side uh, something what is called as inventory lockup. Think about a case where um, somebody you have, let's say, a thousand items of certain kinds, and and the malicious actors come in and then they simply add those thousand items in a shopping cart, um, and that inventory is no longer available um, for you to sell online until this this inventory is freed up from the shopping cart uh, itself. Uh, Fake likes and uh, uh, fake reviews is another use case where uh, there are like thousands and thousands of automated uh, uh, bots can come in and then bump up uh, the uh, the ratings of a certain review, uh, good or bad, um, or 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 try to automatically put in fake reviews on site. Uh, we also see cases around. Uh, fake uh, account creation where you might have a promotion going on that you get, let's say, X number of credit credits or uh, uh, so certain uh, maybe dollars or something like that when you create a, a new account. And the bad actors can, can end up creating hundreds of thousands of such accounts and, and drain out those, those credits that you have available for 
legitimate users. Uh, uh, one other big large use case that uh, that we see in the uh, bot space or, or uh, uh, business logic abuse case is the case of credential stuffing. Um, what we see really is uh, there are billions and billions of username passwords uh, that are available in the black market, especially because of the breaches that have been happening in the past few years. Uh, it's, it's either username passwords or email IDs and passwords. So they, these are stashes of uh, credentials that uh, have been breached uh, through, uh, I think, think going back, right? I mean, um, LinkedIn, Yahoo breach, and most recently Chipotle and, and State Farm and things like that. So, so you, you get these, uh, these credentials. Um, and obviously these companies have go, uh, gone ahead and, and reset the username passwords for these guys to protect the individuals. Uh, but the other sites uh, continue to uh, have uh, the same username passwords just because normal human being tends to reuse the same passwords across multiple sites. So what bad actors do is they take advantage of that and they take these stolen credentials and then try it on our retail sites or XYZ retail site. And any hit they get um, is, is money to these guys. So that's another uh, typical case of, uh, of a bot attack. Uh, and the last protection uh, that you need is uh, protection against uh, application layer DDoS. Now think of it as your, your monolithic application here. Um, it needs to scale up and down um, with uh, with the kind of traffic that is that is coming in. But uh, when when your traffic is uh, 70, 80, 90 percent sometimes uh, coming from the synthetic tra traffic that is being generated by these bots, uh, it, it it may scale up at just the the web server level, but not necessarily at the application level or the backend data, database level. And, and because of that, it leads to uh, unavailability of the application um, and, and maybe even sometimes slow down. So some, in some ways, app DDoS attacks are related to uh, bot attacks as well, but it ha doesn't have a security implication, but more of an uh, availability impl implication. So uh, from your perimeter defense perspective, um, uh, uh, for your monolithic applications, uh, you need all these kinds of defenses in place. No matter where your application is running, it could be running in, a, in your data center, it could be running in a public cloud, wherever that might be. So now coming to uh, uh, the, the new world of where these monolithic applications uh, are, are being sort of split up into uh, microservices for various different benefits, right? I mean, we all understand the limitations of, uh, of monolithic applications. Um, it's very hard to, uh, to roll out new, new updates to these applications. There are so many dependencies uh, between different components uh, that anytime you touch one component, it might lead to uh, sort of breaking some other component and uh, you have to just rely on one uh, uh, application stack, maybe it could be on Java, Node.js. It's harder to, uh, for the development teams to, to sort of develop at a much faster pace that the, sort of the new world needs. And, and that's why uh, people are moving towards microservices. And again, uh, you guys are all probably experts in this space, but uh, just, just to give you an idea how these applications are, are breaking up, um, so the, the original monolithic app that we spoke about can now potentially be split into, let's say, a user management microservice that uh, then in turn can potentially talk to uh, the data access microservice. You might have a shopping cart microservice that is separate. Uh, you might have a customer reviews and ratings uh, microservice. Uh, you might have, have an inventory management microservice and so on and so forth. And all this is being orchestrated through your uh, orchestration platforms like Kubernetes or Istio and, and so on and so forth. Now, you can then individually scale these applications. Uh, so let's say uh, you have an uptake in the new, new, new uh, new customers because you have a promotion going on. So you might just want to individually 
scale the user management service and not necessarily everything else. You might have a uh, sort of a Thanksgiving sale going on and you might want to scale up uh, the shopping cart and uh, customer review service. So you, you, you can sort of uh, take sort of a scalpel-like approach to scale up and down these services uh, rather than scaling up the entire application stack um, in, a, in a monolithic site. So these, these are sort of the benefits uh, of, of uh, the, the microservices uh, based approach uh, rather than a monolithic application. Now, all these services, uh, when they were working in, in a sort of a monolithic environment, they were talking to each other. These components probably still existed, but they were talking to each other using function calls or, or uh, RPCs or something like that. Uh, but but in, in the sort of the, the microservices world, these applications are loosely coupled, they are exposed through APIs, uh, and, and, the, and these APIs have sort of a, a, a contract sometimes that, okay, uh, only these services uh, can, can talk to other services, I'm, I'm going to talk over TLS, and so on and so forth. Uh, but they are still prone to uh, the kind of attacks that we spoke about uh, earlier. Uh, and let's drill down a little bit more here. So, uh, so when we move from uh, the, the monolith world to the microservices world, there's, these are some of the additional uh, challenges that you have to worry about. Number one is because of the newly exposed uh, APIs uh, for these microservices, you have a whole lot more entry points uh, into your environment. Right. They might not necessarily be uh, exposed directly, uh, but they might be exposed indirectly uh, in the sense that the data access service might not be exposed directly to the outside world, uh, but every time you invoke uh, the user management microservice or an inventory management microservices, it might uh, sort of indirectly invoke the data access service. Or that you could even compromise one of the microservices that are running internally and then abuse the other microservices just because they are uh, they are exposed uh, internally. Sometimes these services can even break the contract that okay, I'm only um, rather than doing a account uh, sort of a check or or authentication, I might be doing something else just because uh, somebody compromised some some other microservice. So so that's. Uh, one aspect. The second aspect is the scale out aspect, uh, where in, in the monolith world, you were scaling out um, uh, the entire application stack, stack in one go, and you had sized your appli runtime application uh, security services to maybe for the peak. Um, so let's say in the Thanksgiving time, I, I need like five gigabits of traffic. And that's why my, my, my app runtime application security stack is actually sized for that. Uh, but it does not account for specific uh, services that are scaling, scaling up and down um, because the needs uh, for your application security stack might rely on the individual components and the security that they need rather than sort of a, sort of a single uh, sort of a brush of, okay, uh, I just need to have this much capacity. Uh, so that's, sorry, this is falling down for me. Uh, so that, that's another uh, security challenge that you face there where you have individual mic microservices uh, that are scaling up and down. How do you scale up and down your security services uh, along with it, especially uh, when these services are in some ways disconnected uh, from, from the microservices themselves? Uh, the second big aspect uh, is around keeping up with the sort of the DevOps space, the security keeping up with the uh, DevOps space. Uh, so earlier, there was a single monolith application um, and the security team was uh, actually working with the application team anytime you were rolling an update to the application and, and working closely with them. The whole idea of moving to microservices is the de development team, the operations team, they can, they can, they can move with a lightning speed. They can roll out new microservices uh, uh, while coexisting with the older microservice. They could, uh, uh, let's say they have a new version of the shopping cart application. 
that they want to expose maybe just to the 10% of the customers first and then, then sort of scaling up or dialing up to the rest of the community. Uh, they might, might want to phase out the, the, the reviews or ratings application and then roll out a new one. Uh, or, but they want, only want to do it based on a region. Uh, so, so new applications are being rolled out at a, at a much faster pace. Uh, and, and how does the application security uh, become aware of these applications? So the discovery aspect, the protection aspect, uh, this becomes a, a challenge uh, from the uh, application security uh, perspective. Uh, the third one um, is, like, like I said earlier, um, is earlier you would depend just on sort of one kind of application um, secure application stack. Now what microservices allow you to do is you could have a, a heterogeneous environment, uh, right? Your user management service uh, could be running on a Java stack. Uh, your, your data access could be on the PHP stack. Uh, you might want to move uh, uh, the shopping cart to uh, Node.js stack and, and so on and so forth. So you see what you have is rather than a single stack and sort of a, uh, uh, that, that, uh, that the security team needs to deal with, uh, you are, now you have a heterogeneous environment and, and newer and newer stacks keep, keep coming up. And the security team, um, again, needs to worry about these individual services and the kind of protection that they need rather than sort of, again, a single approach to, to, to solve that problem. So that's another uh, big challenge uh, that uh, the security teams uh, need to deal with um, when, when you have this heterogeneous environment as opposed to the historical uh, 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 monolith application. And, and so one last aspect um, that uh, what, what these uh, microservices allow you to do is uh, ability to run in, in multiple clouds. So, so you could be in the data center, you might have started off uh, with something that like an on-prem of uh, Pivotal or OpenShift and you could be uh, uh, moving to, to the cloud and some of your serve microservices are still running on-prem uh, and then uh, some are running in the cloud. And, and the, the perimeter-based defense approach doesn't really work there because there is no real perimeter in that case. Uh, you have all these services that are spread out uh, in different environments, and uh, the applications could be moving uh, from on-prem to uh, to in the cloud, and and so on and so forth. Uh, so you have to deal with that with that situation. Now, so so what is the new approach uh, that uh, we can we can actually uh, work with so that uh, we can keep up with the the, uh, the needs of uh, the microservices. Uh, so what, what we're proposing is, is a new way to do this. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, so rather than moving having application security at the perimeter level, the application security uh, needs to move uh, closer to the applications themselves, the microservices that they are, they are, they are actually running. Uh, what that means is uh, this, uh, the the appsec at runtime needs to pack it, be packaged in as containers and and the uh, and and run in the same pods as as the applications themselves. Uh, so when when you are um, when you are scaling up your application, it just scales up and down with that application. Uh, it needs to uh, the way it can it can work is it, it can work with your sidecar. So when you're in the in the in the pod, uh, one approach to do that is be the sidecar itself, where uh, it is it is uh, working uh, uh, when the the request comes in. It tries to hit the API. It inspects the application, gives it a thumbs up or thumbs down. If it's a thumbs down, it goes ahead and and takes the application out, uh, the, the request out. Uh, and if it's a thumbs up, um, it, it lets the application through. But you do need to, to worry about the existing side, sidecars that you might have uh, in place. Uh, you might have be working with an Envoy proxy or an Nginx proxy that, is, that you rely on for your application delivery. 
and you don't no necessarily need to uh, uh, to rip and replace uh, the existing sidecars just because you want to to put security in. Uh, so so this this these uh, these security microservices can actually be injected in conjunction with your existing sidecars, either as a side sidecar chain, where the where your uh, uh, the the primary sidecar is hit has uh, it might be your envoy. It passes on the request to uh, to the AppSec sidecar and then sort of uh, upstreams it to uh, the actual micro application microservice that you are interested in. So it it can that way coexist with with the the existing automation that you have in place, orchestration that you have in place, and and uh, the existing services uh, that you have in place. So. Uh, so just so this is this is what the uh, uh, the the new runtime application uh, protection uh, needs to look like um, in in the new world. Rather than having uh, sort of a application security at the perimeter level, uh, which has no understanding of these microservices themselves, uh, it needs to move closer to the app uh, to the application uh, themselves. That way, uh, you are targeting uh, the, the few limitations uh, of the perimeter de defense that we spoke about. As you're scaling uh, up and down uh, these microservices at the individual level, your application security uh, is scaling up and down along with it. Uh, as uh, these applications, uh, new applications are introduced, uh, they can automatically be uh, sort of uh, protected through your orchestration platform, like Istio can automatically inject this microservice in the same pod, uh, and, and, and then you're automatically uh, protected uh, around that. Um, you can take sort of a, a scalpel-like approach for protection. Uh, so, so you might have different platforms that you're uh, talking about, like user management running on Java or data services or PHP. Your application, runtime application security uh, stack is focused towards protecting just that application rather than just applying all kinds of generic protections for all kinds of services. So you can, uh, you, you can focus on individual microservices uh, to be protected rather than um, sort of a generic uh, approach at the, uh, at the uh, ingress level or at the, the perimeter level. Uh, and then uh, the last aspect, uh, the limitation that we spoke about uh, uh, in the the monolithic world is uh, sort of as as the as the microservice is transitioning from on prem to the cloud world or from one cloud to another the the security is actually moving with it uh, so you don't need to worry about that okay did i did i protect my application in the 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 new uh, environment it's automatically uh, moving uh, uh, with that with that setup but but this uh, but what you also need along with it is a, a sort of a centralized application security um, uh, visibility and control. So you don't want to individually manage uh, these uh, these parts. You uh, you you need a centralized management uh, that can actually discover all these applications that are coming up. You you get centralized visibility. How many apps are running? What's being abused? Any configuration that you want to. Uh, enable disable for these services. So that's also uh, needs to be delivered as a, as a microservices that is running in your environment rather than going out to the cloud and, and making all those decisions. So that's, that's sort of the, the framework uh, that, that uh, we, are, we are presenting here. So um, sort of, sort of uh, summing up on uh, some uh, must haves in the sort of the runtime application uh, protection for microservices, uh, it, uh, given that you want to empower your developers to, to roll out new, uh, new applications at a very fast pace, uh, it, it needs to be designed to, uh, to work with the existing applications without asking your developers to make any mod modifications. Uh, it needs to be non-invasive in the sense that uh, you don't want to bundle in uh, uh, sort of no agents or SDK or JavaScript uh, in uh, forcing forcing the developers to bundle in these uh, these SDKs or JavaScript. 
uh, rather than it needs to automatically come up uh, when your the the applications are coming up as microservices. Uh, so uh, it needs rather than being sort of uh, uh, bolt on from the outside as a perimeter defense, um, it needs to be a microservices based protection uh, to protect other microservices. Uh, so that it can scale up and down and all have all the benefits uh, that we spoke about uh, earlier. It needs to coexist and not necessarily replace uh, your existing ingress controllers and sidecars. So it needs to, to play well in that setup. And it needs to be a single pane of glass for all your microservices so that uh, you have one place to manage visibility and all those things rather than individually managing every uh, sort of security service that you are, you are running. And that way your protection moves with the microservice wherever it's, it's actually going. So that's, that's sort of a framework of uh, must-haves uh, that, that we've defined um, for, for the new way of doing application security. So um, in the end, uh, I just want to talk about uh, the way you should be thinking about uh, sort of uh, the new app, new security stack. Uh, obviously, you need to worry about the infrastructure security where uh, your Kubernetes environment is actually running, the virtual machines, are they being patched or not? Uh, does, does your Kubernetes stack have any vulnerabilities uh, that can be exploited? So you need to keep up with that. Uh, the next phase is about uh, the, the uh, container security itself. So you could have sort of a, Oh, sort of uh, unpatched ver version uh, of containers that you need to, to be aware of uh, from compliance perspective, uh, visibility and, and, and uh, sort of logging and all those things uh, come into place. Uh, who's talking to who? Uh, is, are they, uh, is the, the communication secure or not? And so on and so forth. But in the end, you also need to worry about the, the runtime of the application itself uh, through uh, protections like web application firewall, uh, sort of auto uh, bot defense and application layer DDoS defense. Um, and uh, rather than having uh, it at the perimeter layer, uh, it's, it's much better to have it uh, closer to the microservice uh, itself um, and, 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 and think about that as part of the, the, the security stack in the, in the microservices world. Uh, so this is this uh, this was more of a introductory um, uh, sort of webinar. Uh, we, we plan to have sort of a follow up webinar on the actual way of actually how to do it, how do you inject these services. Uh, so uh, I look forward to presenting that uh, in the in the coming weeks or months. Uh, um, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, any questions uh, uh, on this? Uh, please free to send it over. Awesome. Thank you, Shreyans, for a great presentation. We do have some time for some questions. Um, and before we jump into that, I will uh, just want to add that KubeCon Cloud NativeCon North America is CNCF's flagship event, and it will be here before you know it. This year, it's being held in San Diego, which should still be sunny and lovely in November. This is the time for the community to come together to further education and to advance cloud native computing. So if you'd like to attend, please go to kubecon.io for more info and lock in your ticket before it sells out. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and jump into questions. Um, it looks like we have quite a few. Um, I can read from the top. Um, Shreyans, Wahid Malik is asking, is this a micro, is this a micro segmentation or nano segmentation solution or both? Uh, so depending on how you look at it, uh, the idea really is, uh, I would think of it as more of a micro segmentation. Um, so as your pods are, uh, the, the security is built into the pod itself. How you define the pod uh, is really up to you. Um, so if you, you can take it to the level of nano segmentation, uh, if you like. Um, so. Uh, it really depends on how you are actually designing that, that solution. Wonderful. And we also have another question from Wahid. It's, do you integrate with something like Apigee, Axway, or Akana? 
so we currently don't. The idea really is uh, rather than uh, integrating at the API gateway level, uh, we are uh, uh, sort of more focused on the, the microservices themselves as they are coming up and down. Uh, uh, we have a generic way to work with the ingress controllers as well. Uh, but uh, if that is uh, something uh, uh, like that we spoke about, uh, the limitations of, of integrating at more at the perimeter level, that could be a, a API gateway as well. Uh, so the approach that we are suggesting is moving it closer to the microservices themselves. Cool. We also have another question uh, from Pradeep Nambiar. It's wouldn't CAPTCHA block the fake request to some extent? Um, not really. Um, so what, what we see is number one is CAPTCHAs uh, have been broken for a while. Uh, and especially in the, the, uh, the sort of uh, Kubernetes or microservices world, we're talking more about APIs uh, and APIs can be exposed uh, uh, primarily for your mobile apps or sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, machine to machine communications and CAPTCHAs don't really work there. I mean, there, there's a lot of information available on our site why CAPTCHAs don't work. Uh, feel free to come there. So there's, it's not a simple answer, uh, but uh, we've seen them uh, broken all the time. All right. Um, another one from Wahid is why wouldn't every API call go through API gateway and then I can apply all my security policies at the gateway choke point? So uh, this, the, the primary difference here is because uh, of the, uh, the, the microservices talking to each other, um, you could have a compromise uh, at, at one of the microservice level and that can be used to sort of, uh, uh, sort of horizontally move and abuse. So you want protection closer to uh, what is getting abused rather than sort of a perimeter based approach uh, to solving it. Okay, um, another question we have from Joe Hackett. How does your AI technology automate resolution once it detects a bot or DDoS breach? Uh, so we have a, a sort of a policy-based approach uh, to doing this. So, so this, this, kinds of, uh, this kind of technology gives you sort of a uh, intent that what kind of attack is actually going on. Uh, so you could see like a scraping activity. You could see uh, uh, something uh, like a fake-like activity. And uh, we, you can define policies ranging from simply blocking, you could rate limit them, or you can even deceive them by sending fake responses. So again, there's a very long answer to it, but uh, uh, you, you, you can definitely go to our site and, and, and look at uh, how, how we can actually do it. So we, but we can, uh, we can have policy-based actions to rate limit, block, uh, even, even send signals upstream for your, your application to decide uh, what you want to do with it. Okay, um, another question from Thomas. Should I understand inject as something done in container build time, pod deployment time, or done during runtime? Uh, pod deployment type. So when the pods are deployed, uh, you can inject them um, as, as they are coming up. Great. A question from Brian Irwin. Are the individual sidecars in each pod sending telemetry to a, a sequence controller within the Kubernetes cluster or to a SaaS-based service that can span multiple clusters slash clouds? Uh, so we have an option for both. It really depends on, 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 on um, our customers. Uh, the, we can keep everything within your environment so that you don't have to worry about uh, the PII leaving the environment or lots leaving your environment. If your company um, is, uh, is supposed to, uh, to sending any data to the SaaS service, um, if you uh, are interested in SaaS service, uh, we support that as well. Very cool. Um, Bhupathi is asking, any open source tools available to run security scanning on Kubernetes clusters? Uh, there, there are a few. Um, I can't think of them on top of my head. Uh, so this is, so what, what, uh, what we, I, we presented here primarily is more of a framework and then um, you can put together uh, uh, the services like these, you don't necessarily have to use sequence to do that. Um, you can use open source services to do the same. Okay. 
Um, I, we have a few more questions from uh, Wahid and Pradeep, so I'll jump into those. Um, is this solution a sidecar solution or is there an agent per container? It's a sidecar solution. So sidecar or sidecar helper. So you don't necessarily need to uh, need us to be the sidecar itself, but it can be chained with your existing sidecar. Uh, okay. And is this hybrid solution where if my app moves to private, public policy, the policy moves with the app? That's right. Okay, great. Do you have support for DKS, PKS, and NKS? Uh, yes, so basically the, the, the kind of approach that we have, uh, PKS, it does work. Uh, we've not tried it uh, with MKS and DKS, but the approach is generic enough to be applied anywhere. Okay. Um, do you quarantine requests or just deny them? Um, we, it, like I said, it's, it's more of a policy-based approach. Uh, we leave, leave it to our customers how um, uh, they want to deal uh, with it. So we can deny them. We can quarantine them in the sense then put them in sort of like a tar pit or an area where it actually doesn't really hit uh, the actual microservice. Uh, we can even send them fake responses. So we have a bunch of options uh, that we can work with. Okay. Um, another question from Brian Irwin. Is there any difference between running the sequence sidecar versus injecting into existing Nginx sidecar? Um, so uh, it really depends on you. So if you don't have anything, uh, you can use the sequence sidecar. Uh, if you, like I said earlier, if you already have Nginx or Envoy sidecar, you can, you can inject uh, uh, into that. Uh, it really depends on how your environment is rather than us, us forcing a particular way of doing things. Okay. Um, and then isn't there risk to let the malicious request already into the pods from the perimeter? And this question I believe is for slide number 13. Okay. Um, so, uh, the, it's, it's, it's sort of a layered defense strategy. I mean, you need to have uh, things that you want to handle at the perimeter layer, things like infrastructure layer DDoS and things like that to be handled at the perimeter. But you can't uh, just stop there. The idea really is you are actually protecting the actual microservice and the protection needs to be closer to that so that it has better context um, around the request. If you, if you just try to do everything at the perimeter, you lose that context, where it's going, what it's doing, uh, and, and if there are sort of other internal malicious actors like other compromised microservices that can take advantage of it. Okay, and do you support a deceptive mitigation which can randomize responses, asks Arjun. We do, yes, we do. So uh, it can be, uh, it's not just a randomized, uh, we can, uh, it can be on a per application basis because every, every application is different. Uh, you can have define your own success fail criteria. You can define a new account creation criteria. You can respond with uh, different languages. So uh, all those options are available. Okay, and I think we are at our final question. What is the po uh, false positive rate that you've seen from the application DDoS layers? Uh, like I said, uh, it, we have sort of a more of a uh, sort of a, um, so short answer is very low false positive rate. Uh, and, and the way you do it is we have a sort of a confidence based approach and policy based actions where you can actually define your own dials. Uh, what is the, the, the rate uh, uh, that you can be happy with? And uh, beyond that, uh, we can just send the signals upstream to your other applications or fraud system so they can combine our signal with theirs uh, to take action. So, so that way you can keep the false positives very low, uh, yet not, uh, uh, not necessarily allowing a lot of bad stuff in. Cool, and it, we, um, we have another question from Brian Irwin. Um, can your solution span into traditional monolithic architectures as well? It does. So basically, uh, the way we've designed it is our delivery model is containers. What this allows us to do is in the traditional monolith art architectures, uh, we can just deploy ourselves in a sort of off-the-shelf hardware uh, in a, in a tr traditional perimeter defense-based uh, uh, approach. Uh, we work well. 
And then slowly when you're transitioning into uh, sort of more microservices architectures, uh, uh, we can transition along with them. Great. And it looks like we don't have any more open questions. Um, so thank you, Shrans, for a great presentation. And looks like that's all, uh, looks like we've covered most of the questions, all of them actually. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. The webinar recording and slides will be online later on today. And we're looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF webinar. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, hosting me and, uh, uh, and the folks that you attended. Thank you very much. Great.